there we send a door. Topa, there we chop the door. Mushi, you pick the door. standing record of community service, for her dedication to humanitarian work and to the healing of others, the Manitoba Medical Association is proud to bestow this honor on Gladys Cook. This is mine. When I hear you know, all these things that I've done, I begin to think about my age. and how strong I am and still going strong. I see successes and those are my goals, those are my aims, those are things that I believe in. I see the happiness in the people, I see the changes in their faces. I see them walk straighter like I had to when I was going through my healing. And I'm not any taller, but I sometimes right now, right, I feel like 10 feet tall. I have found a place in the world for myself. I'm very proud of myself. I did not say that too often, but I am proud. And I will honor this. I have a spot in my house. I'll probably take it to bed with me tonight. <laughs> I thank you for listening. Gladys Cook, or Topa Hayween, stands just under five feet tall. Her people are the Dakota people, people of the Great Plains. In her lifetime, Gladys has received most of Canada's top honors for her groundbreaking work with the marginalized, the incarcerated, the addicted, the scores of wounded people of the First Nations. I was born in a tent. I remember the, they planted a tree where I was born. There was a garden, big garden. You know, and in, over here too, there was a big garden. All this was garden in front of me. All this was flowers that my parents had, flowers everywhere. We had a good home. We had a good life here. The years Gladys spent as a child with her family were short. When she was four years old, Gladys was removed from her home on the reserve. With a few other children, she was taken 200 miles away to the Elkhorn Residential School. My mother never told us anything about why we had to go, but I do remember her telling us that we had to go to school. If we didn't go to school, that uh, we would be taken away and we would never see her, see home again. Some mornings are highlighted by the coming of new children who must be settled in and instructed in the rules and regulations of the school. In the 1800s, the Government of Canada instituted a policy of assimilation for the people of the First Nations. For many families, this meant the forcible removal of children from their homes. They were placed in church-run residential schools. With the help of senior girls training as supervisors, I see that the little ones wash and dress for breakfast. They are taught to enjoy cleanliness, and we try to divide our attentions equally among them. When I went to residential school, I had braids. I had braids and I had my grandmother put a beaded necklace on me, white beads. She knew I was going somewhere. She knew I was going away from home. And uh, when I got to school, they cut my braids off and they cut my beads off. 
and my beads went rolling on the floor and I said, my grandma gave me those and I was picking up the beads. And uh, she told me to go and uh, the staff told me to go and put them in, in the garbage, in the wastebasket. And I said, no, my grandma. And they, so she hit my hand and, and I let them go. But I kept one. I stuck that bead in my mouth. <laughs> and I had for for a long, long time. And I used to wrap it in my nightgown and put it under my pillow. From age four to age 16, Gladys lived at Elkhorn Residential School. She spent only a few short weeks in the summer with her family. Seems the bad things stand out, but the good things is being with my sisters and my mother and, and the family life we had. Those were the good times, but the bad times stood out. When children run away from school, they strap them right in front of the whole dining room, like where we all have our dinner. Those were the scary parts. And then girls were beaten in a basement until they were unconscious. Those are the sad things that happened that I remember. They're terrible. I ran away from school too. <laughs> but uh, I got strapped uh, 20 times. <laughs> and there were six of us girls that ran away. And we all made it home to Criswell. <laughs> <laughs> and we took us two days. We were just tired of uh, the residential school. We're just tired of the whole, and we miss our families. So that's why I guess When Gladys was nine years old, she had an experience at Elkhorn that she would not speak of for over 40 years. I was in bed and I had the mumps and I was fevered up. This man came in and all of a sudden I could feel my covers being pulled off. And I looked up and his eyes, his eyes were just so big and blue. And and I remember he grabbed me and I remember crying and yelling and, and, uh, and I remember him, uh, he slapped me and then, uh, and then his hand came down and uh, hit me right on the moment. And that's when my head just started to, had excruciating pain in my head. And, uh, and my, I had my, my ear was just hurting. My, and I remember uh, things were happening down there, but I was just had my pain was so bad in my head. And I looked at my hands, I had blood on my hands and on my shoulder when I come. He just shook me and he said, you won't tell anybody anything or you'll get it again. And I remember my head was bobbing because it was so painful. When I, uh, and then I was hurting so bad, I wanted to go down to the dispensary. And I got up to walk, and then I saw blood coming down my legs, and I just fell down. I thought, what's happening to me? Blood all over, so I felt I walked away, and I sat down. I, uh, I don't know how long I sat there. I probably passed out for a while. One of the girls found me, she ran for the nurse. They took me to the doctor's house, not to the hospital. When I came back to the school, the girls asked me how was my hand. I guess the nurse told them that I had hurt my hand because there was blood on my hand. And, and so I looked at the girl and I said, my hand is okay. And I felt, I felt, I wasn't, I was scared, but 
I was glad when she asked me about my hand because uh, nobody else said anything about what happened. I'm sure the nurse knew something. I know she must have known, but they just kept it hush, quiet. But then it happened again. It was always that constant fear, 13 and 14, again and again. I used to be a bouncy little girl. I used to chase butterflies, do whatever. I was always on the move. And uh, my mother noticed something different about me, and that I wasn't that happy little girl, that lively little girl that used to be. Deeply traumatized by the incidents of sexual abuse, Gladys tried hard to focus on her schoolwork, determined to hold on to the values that her family had instilled in her. I tried hard to be a good student. I worked, I did my work well. We had a lot of activities, girl guides and uh, sports activities. I did a lot of running. Uh, we had what you call uh, field days at the end of the school term. And, and of course, we had competition against the schools that were around the surrounding area. So I always was, uh, if not the first or second, doing these things too, because my parents said so. And it always also uh, gave me something to strive for. Hard work and strong religious beliefs had been taught to Gladys from birth but she now found herself struggling with her faith and her ties to the Anglican Church. I had to uh, set aside some of the uh, words that I heard in school, like Christian. I had my own set idea about what a Christian was after I left school. This is where I thought, well, I didn't want their God. I know I had that choice after I left school that, that you can have your God. It's not the God that I have. My parents gave me a better one, which was the Great Spirit. In 1945, when she turned 16, Gladys was asked to leave Elkhorn Residential School. At 16 years old, when you're asked to leave, and this whole big wide world out there, where do you go? Now, I'm, how am I going to survive? You know, because I knew uh, leaving home, I didn't want to live on a reserve because of the setup. I think at a very young age, I didn't want anybody to own me. After I left the residential school, I said, I'm going to get off the reserve and I'm going to go. Gladys dreamed of a life off the reserve working as a nurse. She applied to nursing school, but first had to report for testing to determine her level of education. I was so happy because I was uh, thinking I was going to, everything would be all right. So uh, when I got there and took the test, they gave me a grade eight test, and I knew nothing, nothing. They gave me a grade seven, I knew nothing there either. And then when I uh, and it skipped grade six and gave me a grade five, in that test, I recognized two, three words. So I uh, gave me a grade four paper test. And I looked at it, at it. I didn't recognize anything, but I, again, I recognized some words. I didn't write anything, but I sat there thinking, oh, this is grade four. And the man came around, looked at my papers. I'll never forget that look he had. And he just said, I'm sorry. And then as he was walking away, I started getting angry. And I thought, I have a great eight. It doesn't even mean anything. When Gladys attended residential school, government policy dictated that all Native children receive a half a day of schooling and a half a day of vocational training. For Gladys, and many like her, this meant that her grade eight diploma fell far short of the educational standards of the white schools. Deeply disappointed, Gladys was still determined to leave the reserve at Sioux Valley. First I had to go and see the Indian agent to tell him that, we were, that I was leaving. 
And I don't know what he, he was yelling and screaming at my mother. And uh, I don't know what he was saying to her because at that age, I really didn't understand. And uh, so, uh, and then my mother just didn't say too much about it either. But she just said, uh, you're going and uh, nothing here for you, you couldn't go. With her mother's blessing, Gladys left the reserve. She eventually found a job on the housekeeping staff at a hospital in Yankton, South Dakota. She was mysteriously drawn to the area where her Dakota people had come from. I knew there were, uh, there were Dakota people there, but I didn't connect them with anything to do with can, uh, to Canada or anything else. Like most of the Dakota in Canada, Gladys had not at that time been taught the recent history of her people. Only 30 years before her birth, Gladys's grandparents had narrowly escaped from Minnesota across the border into Manitoba. Along with the 1,000 or so survivors of a great nation, they sought the protection of the Canadian government. It was a terrible journey, like many have died, and many, have, many, have, many children were, were, uh, were lost, and uh, a lot of old people have passed on during the course of that journey because already the, the starvation has started. For the most part, the federal government actually ignored them, and so for the Dakota to survive in Canada, they had to do it on their own. They, they didn't get treaty payments, and, and um, as again as mentioned, most often the federal government just hoped that they would go away. So if they felt that they didn't do anything for them, then they'd go back. For thousands of years before the Europeans came, the Dakota people thrived on the unforgiving plains that stretched from the big woods of Minnesota to the Rocky Mountains. Dakota people were hunters and gatherers. They had signed a treaty in 1837 which gave up their triangle of land between the St. Croix and the Mississippi rivers. And they were getting annuities. They were getting payments based on this treaty. They had been uh, basically encouraged, as most tribes were, to become agriculturalists and grow crops. But then, of course, what inevitably happened was the crops were eaten by grasshoppers or the crops failed because of drought and uh, a famine resulted. The government hadn't you know, kept up on their promises to, uh, to get their annuities and, uh, uh, and the food and, and the thing that really I think started the rebellion from what I, I've been told was people were hungry. <laughs> they were desperate. They were desperate to get what they were told they were going to get and there was a certain um, ticket that they would hand out and they were able to get uh, food commodities or something with the tickets um, and they would say get in line and to get the tickets and if you had a white man's haircut you got a ticket and if you didn't you didn't get one so there was a huge push for them to um, give up their Dakota ways and you know Dakota people are very proud it was the younger men who were the ones who got the most angry and they they said, look, you know, we've given and given and given and we're fed up. The three Dakota men went to this farm. They were so hungry that they went to this chicken house. The farmer's wife heard that and she came running wondering what was going on and she saw these Indian people coming out of the hen house. So she ran up to them and started hitting them with a with a broom pretty hard so you turn around and they killed her then it just you know escalated from that point the tensions between the dakota people and the settlers escalated to a full-blown conflict by september of 1862. on september the 23rd the battle of wood lake sealed the fate of the dakota thousands were killed and 1250 were imprisoned a military commission was appointed to try the Dakota prisoners. The trials lasted from, you know, five to ten minutes. And 300 men were sentenced to death by that military tribunal. 
and then uh, eventually uh, Abraham Lincoln had some people go over it. And anyway, they numbered it down to it ended up hanging 38 men, 38 of our warriors. It was the 26th day of December, 1862. They had had to postpone the hanging because they couldn't find enough rope. And many of the of the uh, ones that did the so-called atrocities were already headed towards Canada and out into the Western Plains. And so they just got a bunch of Indians to hang. <laughs> and they didn't, they didn't care whether they were guilty or not. It's the largest mass execution in, in American history. 38 Dakota warriors hung simultaneously in the main square of Mankato, Minnesota. I bet you there's not one in 10,000, or maybe more than that, 100,000 white people that even know about what happened here at Mankato. As they are being brought across the courtyard in the fort to the gallows, uh, they're chanting as they walk. And, uh, and the, their captors um, believe they're singing a pagan song as they, as they walk to the gallows. Um, but there is someone in the, in the fort who is the interpreter who understands uh, some of the Dakota and realizes what they're singing is, is a hymn a chant to uh, many and great who God are their works. And they sing this hymn as they, as they march to their death. I think for me that again shows the depth of spirituality within the uh, indigenous community and, uh, and the strong sense of, uh, of the presence of the Creator in, in the life of, uh, of Dakota people, but also within the life of many indigenous peoples of North America, of Turtle Island. And, and so for me, to, to think that Gladys comes out of a history like that, models such patience and love in the midst of, uh, of the kind of uh, horror and, uh, and death that is a part of the Dakota people and their uh, struggle to survive on the land um, is all the more phenomenal. As a child and a young woman, Gladys knew little of the history of her people. With a price on their heads and a real concern about bounty hunters well into the 1900s, the Dakota who had made it to Canada seldom spoke of their heritage. For Gladys, her quest to find her own way had led her back to the roots of her people. At the hospital in Yankton, she worked hard and tried to unravel the rules of her new world. At home, we had money, cash. And I never, I didn't know that checks were money. I didn't know that. So I thought they were just giving me a notice to tell me how much, and I would be getting it. And we I kept it. So I kept three of them before I cashed. I said to my roommate, I said, look, I got another one. And I took the other ones out of my drawer and I showed them to her. And she was quite shocked because I had, still had those. That afternoon we went to the bank. She told me what to do, it. so I, and I learned about checks and how to have a bank account and stuff like that, and which I never learned at home or at school. And at the same time, I said, my mother wants some money, can I send her some? And he said, oh, you have lots, you can send her whatever. So and he said, well, how much would you like to send her? And I said, oh, $50. And uh, the man said, oh, you got way more than that. He said, you can spare it, he said. He said 500, so I said okay. World War II was coming to an end. A notice from the War Department was posted at Gladys's work. Medical personnel were urgently needed on the hospital ships. At the end of the Second World War, some people came and asked if anyone uh, would be interested in volunteering on a hospital ship that was going to be bringing uh, wounded soldiers back from Hawaii and Guam and that, uh, that part of the world back to San Diego. And uh, she said, yes, she would be interested. Yeah, it was uh, quite exciting and I had no idea what I was getting into. Oh, the trip over the ocean was, ah, you know, seasick and you're just turning green and purple and I don't know, it was just so overwhelming. So she went um, back and forth to Hawaii and San Diego and nursed these uh, wounded soldiers. And it wasn't a holiday by any means. It, you know, she was working with severely uh, wounded American soldiers. 
and the smell of smell of fle uh, burnt flesh and things like that was just mm. there. So we wore masks a lot of the time. So it was there that I uh, found what was uh, the sadness of war, you know, what it did to people and stuff like that. So a lot of Native people that were on that, on that boat trip to back and forth. Gladys returned to Yankton and soon met a young Dakota veteran named Clifford John Cook. My husband, he didn't really propose, but he used to say, when we get married and when we get married, this and, you know, and all that. So, uh, uh, and then one day he said to me, um, well, here's some money. He said, go and buy your, go buy your wedding ring. Give me $15. And I went down to this jewelry store and I was looking at all the rings. And so I uh, went home and I told him I, I bought the ring and I said, yeah, here's the change. And then he said, well, we got the ring now, we got to set the date. Gladys married Cliff on September the 29th, 1950. Within a few weeks, she would learn the truth about her new husband. I came home from work one day and here, uh, he was lying on the floor. And I tried to wake him up and, sh you know, and, and uh, wouldn't wake up, so I called the doctor. And uh, he checked him over, and then he looked at me, looked at me, and he said, "Well, cover him, cover him up, and he'll be fine in the morning." And I thought that was wasn't very nice, you know. I thought well, something wrong with him. I can't wake him up, and I, you know, I kind of pleaded with him, but he still didn't. Uh, he just said he'll be fine. So I. Sure enough, you know, next morning I could have woke up and I could smell coffee going. And I thought, what the heck? So I got up and here, here he was in the kitchen uh, getting breakfast and making coffee. And I said to him, oh, you're fine. Are you okay? And he said, I said, I was so worried about you. I was scared. And, and I said, I couldn't wake you up, so I called a doctor. And he said, you what? You know, and so I said, well, I was concerned. And he said, well, don't ever do that again. So, uh, yeah, and a few other choice words and stuff. So I just left it alone. So, but I soon, soon learned afterwards what, what the drinking was all about and, and uh, what, it, what the turmoil it caused. And yeah, there was violence and, you know, fat lips and black eyes and stuff, so, yeah, it wasn't very safe. But the thing I thought, to me, I thought uh, that's part of marriage, it's for better, for worse, you know, you just stay in the situation. Cliff's drinking would worsen year after year, despite the birth of John in 1952 and Jean in 1956. Repeatedly battered, Gladys withstood the abuse until one day Cliff went too far. It all came together when uh, one day he came home and hit our little boy. After that, I just decided, eh, I'm out of here. Desperate, haggard, and missing her front teeth, Gladys packed up the children and left South Dakota. She headed back to her family on the Sioux Valley Reserve. It was a long, long, long bus ride. Stopped in, uh, in Brandon, and I thought, well, We'll have a rest, we'll get a hotel room, have a rest, and, and uh, freshen up, so the kids were tired. So, uh, but nobody would give us a room. And so uh, I even went to the Y, and they wouldn't give us a room. So I thought, well, can't go anywhere, and we can't sit on the street all day. So I took a taxi. And I went out to the reserve and taxi. It was about five o'clock in the morning by then. And uh, so they were, I told the driver, like, honk the horn. So, so, so he did that, and he, uh, sure enough, he woke everybody up. And uh, you know, my, my stepdad uh, took one look at me and after. And, and mother was, I guess, putting her shoes on or what she was doing. And uh, I heard my, my stepfather saying, Dako yichu chesnido, he said. He said, something is not right here. He said, 
look at me and and when I heard him say that uh, I forgot what I looked like. I had uh, bruises were beginning to uh, fade and stuff, like the color of the bruises were beginning to fade. And then my mother was crying but she was on her knees and so I knelt down beside her and I went and we prayed together and cried together. And I told her, I said, everything will be all right. Now I'm home, I'm safe. For a time, things were quiet as Gladys and the children settled into life on the reserve. Then one day, the chief paid the family a visit. Gladys had been ordered to leave the Sioux Valley Reserve by the Indian agent. Once she married off, she was no longer considered an Indian. And so when, if that's the case, then you're not allowed to return to the reserve in any shape or form, including if she had died, she would not be able to have been um, buried on the reserve at that time. Gladys decided to move to Portage La Prairie and applied for a job at the residential school there. Nobody was going to hurt their kids anymore and all that, you know. So uh, anyway, I, I did work there. And, uh, and uh, then the school closed, and then I worked for a while at the hospital. Balancing a job and single parenthood with little support would prove to be too difficult. My children would sleep in, and or else they'd get there in time for the first recess and get into school, but they were missing too many mornings. I was uh, confronted by the school principal and, and the teacher and different people that came to my workplace and called me to the office and said, you have to go on welfare. You have to quit your job and go on welfare. And I said, I felt so stripped of my dignity. I didn't want to go on welfare. And I said that my parents told me that if you have good, strong arms and good legs and a head on your shoulder and work. So then I started to do day work when the kids would go to school. Didn't need any don't need any kind of education to clean some of the toilets, you know. Gladys felt ashamed and powerless. She found the pain and humiliation unbearable at times and looked for ways to cope with it. When I drank, I said, uh, help me forget, but I didn't. The more you drank, the more you talked about it, and the more uh, hate and anger just build up. Desperate for help, Gladys began to attend services at the Anglican church in town. I used to sit in the back, way in the back. And uh, when they last him, I'd leave before they finished. I'd leave the church. I knew her, certainly, but I didn't know much about her uh, story or her background. And um, then she told me some years later that when she attended church there, uh, she didn't think that she was worthy to sit at the front of the church. She would sit in the back row. And I didn't know that. You know, if I had known that, of course, I think I might have acted differently. But I feel a little bit ashamed of the fact that, that I didn't get to know her, you know, the quiet little person that, that uh, Gladys was. Finally, the day came when Gladys found the courage to face her fears and take her place in a church that was part of her heritage. Gladys struggled to find the great spirit of her childhood within the Anglican traditions that called to her as well. Uh, so I wanted to set up where I chose this time instead of hiding. And so I uh, went up to the front. The church uh, has beautiful doors, I used to say, and we keep them locked. <laughs> We're not open to the world as they should be. But people like Gladys, I think, are, are, are helping us to unlock those doors and, and see the world for what it is and how we might be able to fit into it you know, and have some sort of impact. As John and Jean approached adolescence, they turned to drugs and alcohol, 
A brief but loving relationship Gladys had in the mid-60s produced a son, Jeff, born in 1968. Soon after Jeff's birth, Gladys knew she needed help. I had so much anger and fear and hatred. I spent a lot of years carrying that kind of hate, bitterness around. And you don't know what to do with it. You don't know who to talk to. And the damage it does to my children. Gladys turned to a self-help group and took the first steps toward healing. Her daughter, Jean, remembers when things began to change. I used to run away from home. And when I'd come home, Mom would be really upset with me. This one particular time I came home and she said, oh, you're home. I sat outside after a while and some of my friends came over and she just said to me, hey, don't leave, have something to eat. I wasn't planning on going anywhere, but I said, I don't know who that is. Oh, my friend, she's changed, like something happened here. It, it made me want to stick around, but it was the beginning of the healing at that time. I couldn't get a rise out of her anymore like I used to, <laughs> as I used to, you know, get her mad and then if I didn't want to do dishes and she was, she'd say, okay, fine, I'll do them. But after a while she'd say, okay, well, can you get to them in the next little while? And I'd, you know, look at her because it was, it was a difference. I couldn't, I had no choice but to do the dishes because she learned some skills there that were just amazing. My younger son was uh, sitting on the chair and I asked him to do something and he didn't do it. So I walked over towards him and he pulled little guy just balled up on the chair and I was standing over him and I was gonna hit him. And I looked at him and I thought, that's what I used to do. I saw how frightened this child was. And so I just said, oh, and then I walked away I walked away and uh, I looked back again to see if, and he was still sitting there. He said he knew, he thought I might come back again, and he was just sitting there waiting for me to come back and hit him. Isn't that awful? Oh, I felt so bad, so bad, my, so, uh, but I, so I just hugged him and I said, don't worry, mom is not gonna do that anymore. Gladys kept her promise to her son. She embarked on a journey of healing that included support groups, counseling, and therapy. As she faced her own demons, the proud Dakota woman began to find the strength and courage that had always been inside of her. We grew up together, but I always kept my parents' side. But I learned a lot from him, and I learned a lot about myself, too, just watching him grow up. Others in her support groups began to gravitate toward her, and Gladys discovered in her own healing a gift for healing others. People just seem to come up to me and talk to me about their, their uh, you know, I guess they must have thought I was all together. Uh, maybe it was because I was a good listener. I didn't, didn't say too much about myself. She was offered a job as a counselor with the National Native Alcohol and Drug Abuse Project. Her training for the job involved going back to school. Going to workshops and going to, to all these, uh, and I also went to a, a course in, at the U of them, and I thought I would never, never make going to university, you know. But I did, I made it, and I got made papers, and became a certified counselor, and yeah. Despite her success, Gladys knew that she had not yet faced the deepest traumas of her past. In 1988, she was invited to attend a training workshop in San Jose, California. The focus of the workshop was assisting the victims of sexual abuse. I was scared, and uh, when I was on the plane and I was on my way to San Jose, I said, okay, when I get there, I'm not gonna talk about myself. I'm gonna listen, I'm gonna learn all I can, and I'm gonna, so I can come and help people. Like I wasn't gonna talk about myself. I think it was the third day I was there, they started to use techniques on how to, what techniques to use on people that won't open up, that wouldn't talk and hear 
And I said that, and all I knew it was, oh, just, just, just yelled, and I, and I don't remember too much after that. But I was so, you know, things were just moving and inside. And then I got up, I got up and I walked away and I just, then this pain came in my head. And I looked down and I even felt warm blood going down my legs and I dropped right there. And I just said, I want to throw up. So I, I got up and, uh, but I couldn't have found a better place because uh, there were people that were working with people that, like me, that needed help. And uh, uh, I didn't feel embarrassed. I didn't feel hurt. I just felt relieved. And one of the therapists told me that. She said, when you start talking, and when you start feeling your pain and when you feel have tears in your eyes, don't stop. Talk and let it out, even though you're crying. Even though you're crying, she said, but let it out. Because if you suppress that again, she said, who knows how long it'll take to come out. We went to a residential school reunion where my mother revealed to me the man that had abused her. but uh, it was well after I had first met him. Uh, when I met him, I shook his hand. I think uh, meeting this man and shaking hands with him, I think is uh, the most powerful turning point in my life that I just seem to feel different. I was leaving with my sister and we were walking towards my car and he drove by with his family and I wanted revenge. I learned also that to forgive myself because of all the hate and the anger I had for all these white people and all the things that happened at school and and uh, my my uh, hate bitterness I had to uh, to let that go too so forgiving him and forgiving myself was I think forgiving myself was harder uh, when I forgave him I just felt him just disappear. Uh, because I saw how old he was and his gray and, and uh, I thought, well, in time, you know, maybe he'll, God will take care of him too. My mother carried pain for years. And I didn't want his pain to be any shorter. The anger is virtually gone. She's strong enough that she doesn't need me to look at her. When I look at my mom, I don't see what she's gone through and stay there. I see what she's done on top of what she's gone through. When I see people that are hurting and suffering, and if I can just help them a little bit in, in, in helping them see that they're okay people, everybody's okay, there's lots of good in everybody, but sometimes it just takes a while to find it. And that's what I try to instill in some of the women that I work with, especially the women in jail. First Nations persons are uh, the poorest of the poor in this land, marginalized. I'm glad it recognizes the impact of marginalization and poverty and how be people become involved in uh, very often in, in property crimes and in uh, violence within their own community. This is the only place where all of us are here for the same reason. All of us have lots of hurts and lots of pain, but it's okay because there are ways to overcome it. And this is a good start. This is healing for all of us. 
Remember the other day when I said the grandfather stopped you from doing what you're doing out there? Put you in here because this is, this is where you have to slow down and take a look at what you've been doing. And don't forget, we're not all bad people. We just happen to get caught. Oh, it's not very <laughs> wise, is it? Oh. I want to thank Gladys for coming. These sharing circles, though, to me, they're, um, they do me a lot of good. They, uh... <laughs> I hope that in April, when I get out, I can stay in touch with Gladys and and all the support people I need in my life to allow me to, uh, to recover from my uh, addictions and my uh, criminal activity. It's when you don't have people there for you. It's, it's when it hurts. And that's when you realize how alone you are. It's where I get high. The only time I wasn't getting high is when I was sleeping. And uh, sometimes I didn't even sleep for a couple of days. It's just, it was crazy, it was pure madness. When I go to the jail, though, I always feel bad because when I come out of the jail, I always look back. I always look back at the jail and I think, some of them are mothers, they're grandmothers. What are they doing in there? They're missing out so much, so much with their children, the grandchildren. Could be me in there grandfather teach us to have the patience and teach us to learn to listen and teach us to respect each other every day. Mitako was in Megwitch. Can you pray for me? developed herself to where she can meet the needs of people that most people ignore. A wounded woman's gift for helping others has turned into decades of groundbreaking healing work. Gladys has traveled all over the world, invited to share her wisdom and teaching. Say it together. Clean mind, strong body, and good spirit. Okay. Those are the things we ask for because some, and we uh, brush the smoke towards us. We're asking for blessings. We're preparing ourselves to pray and to ask for blessings for ourselves and our loved ones. My children would come home from school. They would be so angry because someone would call them a dirty Indian or, or something even worse than that. And, uh, and my daughter came home one day and she was quite angry. She was crying because she said, they did it again, you know. So I said, what happened? And she said, well, they called me an Indian. So I said, well, you are. You are. We're going to talk about this. So I got a blanket, and we sat down on, on the blanket on the floor, and we talked about it. I said, these are the things they're going to call you. So I named a few things that they're going to call us. So if you hear it, we know that's not the way we are, but these are the things that, are, that they call us. So you'll be prepared for them. You'll be ready for them. So we went through that. We smudged. And I said, this is something we have that nobody can take away from us. This is ours. It belongs to us. It's our heartbeat of our home life. She's a small little lady with the strong spirit. Somewhere in there, she was determined to, um, to keep going and not let anything pull her down. And, and when it did, I think the healing, when it came, and she started to speak about the stuff that happened to her, I still, to this day, like I said, I don't know, even know how she managed to do the things she did, but it, it talks about a strong, strong woman, um, brave woman. I, I think that's at the core of, of, her, of her being, is this uh, profound love for people. She has an authority that, that people um, 
simply recognize. She has a wisdom that she carries in her person. What she wants to do and what she likes doing is helping people. That's it. You can um, just feel like you can go over and hug her and just feel that you can just tell her anything you want and she'll understand. Gladys has received many top honors and has become a revered elder among her people. I count my blessings and, uh, and I count more than I deserve. It's overwhelming. For Gladys, perhaps no honor has meant as much as a tribute from her community at Sioux Valley. My mom has always told me to remember where you come from. And uh, if anything, not only do I remember where I've come from, I remember where my mom has come from. And because of that, I appreciate everything she's done that much more. I don't expect any of the words. I don't work towards them or do anything, but uh, that one was very, very special to me because it's my community. My Auntie Hazel made Mom and I a string of beads and necklace to, to wear for today, and Mom has a set on. But she also made some extra ones. She said, those are for my sister to give away to whoever she wants so that nobody will take her beads away. She can give them away. Yeah. Oh, did that ever get to me. I thought, yeah. my goodness. Because of her, I'm going to be a very strong woman. And I hope someday I can be like her. I hear people say to me, oh, I want to be just like you. But I say, I worked hard at it. Oh, I worked hard at it. I could have been somebody negative. I have so much to live for. My children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren. I've learned to love life. It's, it's amazing. It's awesome. But I've, I've learned a lot about myself too. And, uh, and I hope it helps others see for themselves that they are worthy. Special. <laughs>